Hi, and welcome to this talk about Lee Miller's life and work at the Sussex Festival of Ideas. This is our inaugural festival, and we hope that you will find this festival to be dynamic and engaging with a program full of talks, events, and activities spanning the breadth of, of topics and ideas that we explore as faculty, staff, and students in the School of Media Arts and Humanities. This school is produce, produced by us, faculty, staff, and students in the school. We are a newly formed school and we've chosen this festival to kind of launch our collaborations together across the Media Arts and Humanities at Sussex University. A bit of housekeeping. Um, first of all, my name is Professor Mary Agnes Krell and I am the Artistic Director of the festival. Uh, we will be recording this festival and we will post the festival to our website or are we recording elements of the festival and posting them to the website afterwards? Not all of our sessions will be recorded, but we encourage you to take a look in the coming days and weeks or to follow us on social media where you'll see examples of what's recorded. We will not be recording you, the audience members, only our speakers. The other bit of housekeeping is that a member of our festival team may choose to get in touch with you after the fact to ask what you thought or to um, ask you to share your views about what a future festival might be. And if you would prefer not to be contacted, just get in touch with me or any other member of the festival team by going to the Sussex Festival of Ideas website um, and contacting any one of us on the About the Festival or the con uh, About the Team page. Um, now, this particular session has a lot of people taking part and there will be um, a space for a bit of Q&A near the end. Um, there is a Q&A at the bottom of your screen. You can ask questions there. Um, that where time permitting, we will pick up. Um, if you uh, would like to know more about anybody uh, involved in this, you can look at the festival website or follow them in their own spaces. Um, but the last thing I'd like to say is that this is one of the events I was really looking forward to. Uh, we as a university have worked with the Lee Miller Archive and Farley's House on numerous occasions with faculty from different schools across the university, engaging with them on different types of projects, publishing projects, um, visual projects, interactive projects, and more. And one of the things we decided as a school is that we want to continue to work with the Lee Miller Archives and Farley's House because we think their work is fantastic, in fact, world leading. And so I'm genuinely excited to introduce my colleague, Martin Evans, who's put this panel together today. And if you haven't checked out his work, please do because you're in for an absolute treat. Martin, over to you. Right, thank you, Mary, and welcome to everybody. And yes, I'm really looking forward to this conversation tonight. Um, we've got a fantastic panel. So if I can just introduce, we have Tony Penrose and Amy Buhassain from the Lee Miller Archives. Uh, I mean, they are, there's obviously a strong family connection. Tony is uh, Lee Miller's son and Amy Buhassain is uh, uh, her granddaughter and they've both um, uh, written extensively and curated extensively on uh, Lee Miller. And then we have two historians. Uh, so we have Sarah Dunstan from uh, Queen Mary and uh, Westfield, who is an expert really on France empire and uh, the relationship with, uh, with America and with uh, uh, Hannah Diamond, who is an expert on 20th century France, but in particular, the, the occupation period and she curated an excellent uh, exhibition that took place in Paris last year on the uh, on the fall of France and the exod in 19, 1940. So that's a really fantastic panel that are all going to bring different perspectives on uh, uh, Lee Miller, who I think, I mean, I'm probably very biased, but I think she's one of the most remarkable artists of the 20th century. But in this conversation, we're gonna be really focusing upon two moments in her life, two key episodes. The first is in Paris between 1929 and 1932. And the second is the liberation of uh, France, Paris and Western Europe in 1944 and 1945. I think that these were two transformative moments in her life, uh, personally, culturally, politically, artistically and really we're going to be looking at these from a variety of different different uh, perspectives. I think here one key word is undoubtedly going to be liberation, so the extent to which Lee Miller's artistic practice <coughs> really broke down, uh, it seems to me, uh, uh, boundaries, boundaries in absolutely fascinating ways, but we're also going to be thinking about her relationship with Paris. What did Paris come 
to uh, to, uh, to 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 mean for her. And really, what I'm going to do is start off really. I mean, it's going to be a conversation. People are going to come in at different moments uh, on different topics and themes. But I'm going to start really firstly with, with Tony talking about this, this moment from 1929 to 1932. So Lee Miller goes to, to Paris in, in 1929. Could you just very briefly, before we get there, give us some sense of her kind of social background and social social media kind of very briefly and kind of where, where is she coming from in terms of, of her own sort of place within society? Well, Lee's place in society was uh, not remarkable. She came from a, a kind of bourgeois background. Her dad was an engineer, her mum was a nurse, and she grew up in a small town just in the northern part of New York State, a town called Poughkeepsie. Uh, you know, there were not many career opportunities for young women in her world, but she had a lucky accident. She stepped out in front of a car and was saved from, or a truck maybe, and was saved from being run over by Condé Nast, who was the owner of Vogue and Vanity Fair. And he looked at her and saw immediately the face of that moment, and he put her on the front cover of Vogue magazine. And that got her involved with the photography because this was the wonderful moment in the history of magazines when photographs were just beginning to take over from illustrations, from drawn illustrations. And one of the key people was Edward Steichen, Lee's uh, <coughs> Vogue's chief photographer. And she photographed him. Now, can we have the first slide, please? I'm sorry, he photographed her, is what I'm trying to say. Have we got the first slide, Alan? Yeah, there we go. And the next one. Right, okay. So this is Lee by Steichen, modeling for Vogue. And this was a shot she made on spec. You know, in other words, she was paid for it. She signed the model release, but she had no idea what it was going to be used for. And a few months later, to her absolute horror, she appeared coast to coast, nationwide, in this advertisement for Kotex. Now this was considered absolutely scandalous because there was a big taboo about women's hygiene products. And it was the first time a woman's image had been used to advertise the, uh, the product. And the, they also, without any recourse to her, made it look like she was endorsing the product as well, um, says famous modiste. Well, this, brought Lee's modeling career to an absolute skidding halt. By this time, she had done very well. She was what we would today call a supermodel. And it killed that career overnight because no couture house wanted the Kotex girl modeling their frocks. So that was fine. She said uh, she <clears throat> had already been to Paris when she was 18 and in, in, in 1925. And she had a great fascination for the place. And Edward Steichen encouraged her. And he gave her the address and the introduction to Man Ray, the, uh, the man whose name meant modern photography, uh, uh, an American living and working in Paris and part of the surrealist group of artists. So, Tony, you said that she'd already been to Paris in 1925. And... One of the things that you've always emphasized to me is, is this idea that she immediately, in some way, felt at home. What, what, what did that mean for her? Why, why did she have this kind of automatic affinity with, with Paris? Growing up in America, I think she realized that she was different. I mean, she'd had, a, when she was a, a seven year old, she'd had the most appalling trauma of being raped and infected with venereal disease. And I think that gave her a sense of otherness, a sense of not belonging in the mainstream. And as you can possibly imagine, Middletown America was kind of very uh, disapproving and, and, and censuring of that kind of thing. So when she got to Paris as an 18 year old, uh, she describes how she walked down the street for the first time and she said to herself, baby, I'm home. She just, felt so liberated, so free, and among people who did not disapprove of her or would not like to disapprove of her. What did that sense of freedom mean? You know, what, what was it 
did that did that mean to him? <clears throat> kind of, um... Well, um, it's hard to describe because we've got no parameters really in our own life. But if you can imagine small town middle America uh, being very very constrained, and you know people were her mother was a, a member of the daughters of the American, or she tried to be. Uh, she was a member of the Daughters of the American Revolution. That was the kind of family aspiration. This was a you know, hard-edged, ultra-right-wing sect of people who, uh, women particularly, who felt that they were the guardians of the, the, the moral um, aspects of, of life in, in, in America at that time. And I think Lee was just one of those people who was not going to accept other people's values and other people's instructions as to how she was going to live her life. So was she very much what a rebel against white Anglo-Saxon, I mean waspish America? Was that absolutely situated? Absolutely. And in fact, <clears throat> when she went back to America after the war, she recognized that she could no longer live there because she had become what she described as being too Europeanized. Okay. That's fascinating. And what 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 happened to in Paris? So she goes to Paris in 1929 this idea that Paris for her is going to be a place of, of liberation. And can you just explain to us what, what happens to him in Paris? What, 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 you know, well, what happened happen? really was that she needed to earn a living and she wanted to become a photographer. Um, she had some experience of photography from her dad, who had, was an amateur photographer. And of course, also, when she was working with people like Steichen, she... Um, was constantly asking questions. She had a mind like a sponge, just soaking it all up. And this, I think, had determined her career path. Uh, she could have been an artist, but she <laughs> made some crack about she realised that every painting that was ever going to be painted had been painted, and therefore she wanted something that was new and exciting. Um, and photography, of course, was new and very exciting at that moment. So that's why she went to look for Man Ray, because he was such a groundbreaker, such a uh, innovative and, and, and person. And of course, he was a surrealist. And the surrealists firmly were never going to have anybody tell them how to live their lives. And how did, how did the, the sort of creative and obviously personal relationship with Man Ray, how did that, how did that transform? How did, she, how did she become a kind of surrealist photographer during this, this moment? Well, I've always said that she was a surrealist way back in America before the movement even had a name, uh, because she had this way of, of taking responsibility for herself and doing things her way and standing or falling by the consequence thereof. So she wasn't going to be a conventional person. And the surrealists really epitomized that because they coming up, you know, following on from the Dada movement, they were not going to follow the rules. The experiences of the First World War had shown them just how awful the society was that made the rules in the first place. So why should they follow them? And I think that appealed to her enormously. So there's a kind of affinity in terms of that surrealism being a rebellion against bourgeois society, which, which mirrored her own rebellion against, against waspish America. Exactly, yeah. Yes. I want to talk about this, the, some of the two of the other images that you that you've selected, Adam. Do you want to just move on from the slideshow, please, to sort of yeah. go from the um... well? She went to find Man Ray, and she was actually uh, had an immediate affinity with him. Uh, she became his his lover straight away, and in a way that was important, but not as important as the fact that she became his collaborator. And I think he loved her inquisitiveness, or at least that was one of the things that he was remembered about her later, was that she was always asking questions and she was always trying new things and wanting to do things differently. And that was very appealing to him because he was a great innovator. And he loved, he loved just tearing up the rules and reinventing things. And they straight away, they went off on holiday together to Biarritz. And that was the beginning. That was kind of like start as you mean to go on because there was that intimacy, there was that affection, and that was that, that wonderful process of shared ideas. So Adam, do you want to just move into the next slide with uh, of Lee? There we go, Lee. there she is, and here. Yeah, she is. So together, one of the most striking things that they invented or Lee actually rediscovered 
was the technique of solarization, which you see in all of these three images here. And it was um, a moment when she was developing some plate negatives in Man Ray's dark room and a rat ran over her foot and she turned on the white light. Now you just do not do that when you're developing, dish developing plate negatives. And Man Ray seeking to save the images snapped the light off, dumped them in the fixer. And when they looked at them, they found they had this extraordinary quality of the blacks being reversed out, leaving these dark lines around the images, this kind of reverse halation. And it was something that absolutely fascinated Man Ray. It had already been discovered by a guy called Sabatier some years earlier, but these two, they took it and they made it their own and Man Ray renamed it solarization. And Lee used it consistently right up until the 40s when she was using it for fashion shots in Vogue magazine. I suppose so, so in a way it was it was a discovery by mistake. I mean, I know that the surrealists love mistakes. Yeah, exactly. But you see, that's what made it so wonderfully surreal. It was the element of chance. And chance, in this case, had led them to this fantastic discovery, which they both used very creatively. I just want to ask you just one final question in, in this kind of um, introductory part, which is about her politics. I mean, you've talked about kind of, in a way, her rebellion against waspish America, but on the other hand, the kind of idea that, that, that sort of Quakerism or Quaker values were kind of important. Did you want to just say something about that? That would be really interesting. Um, as far as we know, Lee wasn't a Quaker in, in the accepted sense, but she did go to a Quaker school and the school was actually, you know, like half a mile from her home. Uh, the principal became a great friend of her father's, which was surprising because her dad was an avowed atheist. But it wasn't the religion side that appealed to both of them. It was the humanitarian side. It was the idea of peace and freedom and justice and truth being such important values. And those were all things that were really, really important to the surrealists. And that's one of the reasons I say that she was a surrealist before the movement was started, because she actually had these values absolutely as core things, you know, core values of her life. And I think that came from the Quaker influence, but it was something that she hung on to. And right through her life, we can see time and time again, these were the so things interesting. that were important. I'd like to turn, return to that at the end of the talk, really, in terms mm. of thinking about this idea of the Quakers, the idea of bearing witness. And I think that's yes, especially indeed. important in terms of thinking about what she saw and experienced in 1944. And, 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 and right. politically, she was a socialist. And during the war, uh, she was investigated by MI5 because they thought that she was some kind of communist and they were very suspicious of her. So would she, I mean, many of the surrealists, of course, that she frequented did end up as members of the French Communist Party. Was, was, did mm -hmm. she see herself as a fellow traveler? No, because they were deeply suspicious of the Communist Party, particularly after Stalin had so many absolutely dreadful atrocities and genocides and everything to his name. Paul Eluard had a perpetual kind of blind spot about Stalin, but not the others. No, well, not certainly not the Roman. Um, they were very sympathetic to the principle of communism and the fact that the communists were the only guys that stood up to Franco uh, in the time of the British non-intervention period, the Spanish Civil War. But no, they were not going to be part of any to totalitarian regime. If, any, if you wanted a label, it would be something like an anarchist. Right, okay. So there wouldn't have been a flirtation with Trotskyism or a kind of... No, definitely not. You see, that was all that was all the big firms. And they believed in the rights of the individual to make their own choices. Right. OK, that's really, really interesting. And so in a sense, really fascinating to think about that trajectory in the 1930s. Okay. Yes, it was a bit way ahead of itself, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah in terms of questioning all on all sides, really, which is kind of really, really interesting. OK, well, well, thank you, Tony. That's a really fantastic way to sort of start off the whole kind of conversation. Um, I, I want to bring in Sarah now, Sarah Dunstan, because obviously we've got this relationship with, um, with Lee Miller, the American in Paris. And I wonder if you could, so if you could just unmute yourself, um, um, <laughs> just to sort of say, in a sense, um, 
could you give us some context? Why, why were American avant-garde artists after World War II, why, why were they attracted to Paris? And what was their image of Paris? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I mean, I think for many Americans, Paris was the city of light. It was the so, so if you just come into your microphone a little clear, a little closer so I can hear you. That. Is that better? Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Okay. I, I was just saying, um, for many Americans uh, in this period in the 1920s, uh, Paris was a city of light. It was the cultural capital of the Western world. Uh, and, you know, many American writers, artists, musicians made their way to Paris as a kind of apprenticeship in their art during this period. I mean, you have, um, perhaps most famously, you have people like uh, Ernest Hemingway and Gertrude Stein, who coined the phrase the lost generation, the generation of, of American uh, sort of artists who find themselves in Europe, spend a lot of time in Paris, engage with movements like the Surrealist movement. You have F. Scott Fitzgerald and his, his wife, Zelda Fitzgerald, who are there, uh, T.S. Eliot, you know, these leaders of, of modernism. You also have, um, you know, incredibly like leaders of the African-American artistic sort of movements. The 1920s is a period uh, which is associated with the Harlem Renaissance, but many of the African-American writers and artists who you know, were leading lights of that movement spent time in Paris in the 1920s and the 1930s. So you have people like the, the sculpture artist Augusta Savage, you have the poets and, and writers Langston Hughes and County Cullen. Uh, for, many, um, for many of these African-American uh, individuals that you know, Paris offered a kind of escape from the dynamics of race relations in the US. And that was true of, of a, a lot of different Americans and as it was for Lee, right? Paris offered a very different kind of freedom, a very different kind of experience for them to you know, really work out what they wanted to be artistically um, and creatively. Okay, okay. That's really, really interesting. So do you think in a way kind of Lee Miller was, was, was typical or? Or, or atypical, I mean, typical. I mean, she's not typical, no, but, but, no. but kind of. <laughs> I know, mean, I think, I think she's a very, um, she's very atypical in that she carves out a very particular route for herself. Um, I think she shares in common with this generation of Americans who, who go over there, this desire to, to, to explore and this, this understanding of Paris as a moment that is, you know, really particular that they can get something out of this that is is different. But I think, you know, I think Lee's attitude, I think the way that she introduces herself to, to Man Ray, as Tony's just explained, I think is very particular to her. I think she has a very particular sort of vibrant personality and, and to um, a, an attitude where she gets on with it. If she wants it, she's going to do it. Um, I think that it might be interesting to draw a comparison between between Lee and someone like the the English heiress Nancy Cunard. Mm. Um, so she Nancy Cunard was the heir to the Cunard shipping line, um, who was herself um, a little bit of a, a free spirit, and she'd come to Paris. She was also a muse uh, in the way that Lee is often cast as a muse, but like Lee, she chose to take on different creative uh, endeavors, and hers were very much uh, engaged with um, the African-American but sort of wider African diasporic community. And she, she most famously uh, edited a collection called Negro, an anthology, which was this extraordinary collection of um, work by black writers and artists from throughout the world. And yet like Lee, she is often uh, understood uh, mainly through her modeling work um, mainly through her relationship with uh, famous uh, men who also had their own artistic um, and creative endeavors. So I think I would never describe Lee Miller uh, as typical, um, but I think she did have some experiences in common uh, with other people of, of her generation who are exploring Paris at this time. Okay, now there are three images that you selected from, from the Lee Miller archive. So Adam, if you could just move on to the next slide, please. Could, could you just talk to us about these images, Sarah, and say so what, why you think they're important for us in terms of thinking about, about, about this moment in, in terms of Lee Miller's kind of creative journey? 
Absolutely. So the, these photos were actually taken in New York, but they're definitely the product of, of Lee's time in, in Paris, in France, because uh, the, the, uh, this, I've selected a set of three photographs, which are of three cast members of an opera called uh, Four Saints in Three Acts, which was written by uh, Gertrude Stein, whom I mentioned uh, just before. And it's, it's, an, it's an opera that is considered a landmark in American modernism. And uh, essentially um, it, was, it was one of the first, well, it was the first opera to have an entirely black cast. And this cast uh, was, um, was selected from Harlem uh, nightclub singers and, and dancers. And it opened, in, um, it opened at first in Hartford, Connecticut, um, to coincide with the first all uh, Pablo Picasso exhibition to be held in the United States. Um, and the director of this play was a friend of, of Lee's called John Houseman. And he asked her to take photographs of, of the cast. And by the time she was taking photographs of them, the play had moved to Broadway. It was a phenomenal success. Um, at the time, it, and I believe still to this day, it was the longest running opera in American theater history. Uh, so it's an incredible landmark. It's also really important uh, in understanding the black history of the United States, because until this moment, really, you know, there had, there were um, African-American uh, actors on Broadway, but they usually played the role of either a prostitute or a nursemaid. So this is the very first time that they're, you know, given these rich uh, roles and they're doing so in what's a very avant-garde play. So this first uh, image is of Alcinelle Hines. Um, and the next one, if we could move on, uh, thank you, um, is of uh, Bruce Howard. And uh, the final one is of Edward Matthews. Now, if, sorry, Adam, but could, if we could just now return to that perfect pictures of the, the women. What I discovered in conversation with um, Tony and Amy is that Lee, uh, Lee's innovation in photography once again comes to the fore in taking these photographs. And she applied uh, this red filter uh, to, to these photographs in order to um, uh, whiten the skin of, of these actors. Now, this was at the request of the actors themselves. Now, race relations in the United States are incredibly uh, complicated. And in, in this moment in the 1930s, uh, the African-American community faced a huge amount of discrimination, a huge amount of segregation. And there was a preference for um, paler, paler skin. And as a result, uh, these women who, who wish to continue their success in their careers theatrically really wanted to be portrayed in as light a way as possible. And so Lee helped them uh, perpetuate this image and you know, use this red filter to um, help them affect the palest possible complexion. Now to a contemporary audience, this, this is very uncomfortable and this feels very, um, it, it doesn't feel right, but it is very reflective of the impact of racism upon individual, you know, African American performers and artists and, and women in particular, who were holding themselves to these standards of, uh, you know, a racist understanding of, of what beauty meant. Um, and I think that that's an interesting insight into the context that Lee Miller was operating in. And what, what do you think it says in terms of sort of Lee Miller in a way being involved in a project like that, which is foregrounding the kind of um, creative achievement of, of African Americans in, in, in this way? What, what do you think it says about, about her and sort of her particular, particular trajectory? Well, I mean, my understanding of, of Lee, and I'm sure that, that Tony and Amy will have more to add on this, is that she didn't she didn't have much time for, for racism. Um, you know, there's a story when she, she marries her Egyptian husband um, later on where she, you know, the, the cleric at the registry office where they're getting married, you know, makes a big fuss about the fact that it's really not a good idea for her to be marrying a man of color. And she gets so angry with him and makes such a scene that the clerk actually, you know, expedites the, the process of the marriage. So I think, you know, Lee is very much someone who has no time 
to that kind of racism and it is not you know she has friends who are from multiple different uh, backgrounds and is not really you know at all which makes her you know an unusual woman for her time and for her background yeah i think it's very much this idea of the way in which she's kind of very much at the forefront of of, of, of breaking down boundaries right that was really interesting really fascinating um if i could just so now move on, just ask just Hannah, please, really, because I think that what we've got now is, is, is Tony set up brilliantly, kind of like the personal trajectory. Sarah's brilliantly given us a kind of this American Paris kind of relationship. But I'd really like to sort of like hear, hear from you kind of in a sense sort of, um, you know, Lee Miller goes to Paris in 1929. She's there for three years. What were the kind of political, cultural and social context that she would have encountered in in, in, in Paris and, 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 and France at, at this time? You know, where, where's France kind of politically and, and socially? Well, politically, That's a I big think, question, I know. It's <laughs> a yeah. huge question. How long, how long did you say I had? Um, <laughs> um, generally speaking, I think this period, the end of the 20s and the early 30s, is a bit of a turning point in in France. The, the earlier post-war, you know, we've seen economic prosperity coming out of the First World War, beginning to wear off. And there's a kind of pervading sense of decline and growing political unease and growing calls for renewal and change. Um, now, the Paris that Lee knew um, was very different, I think, from what was going on in the rest of France, which um, the 1931 census did say that there were more French people living in urban areas than in agricultural areas, but the definition of urban and urban area is quite a loose one. Um, and we all know that most Parisians had their roots in the countryside, in the provinces. So Paris is different. And even within Paris, the glamorous cosmopolitan radical Paris that you've all been evoking that, that was very closely centered actually, I think on Montparnasse, mm -hmm. which is where the Surrealists hung out. And, and I think Amy will be telling us shortly about where Lee's studio was also, was not an area that even all Parisians uh, would regularly would regularly go to. I mean, there were the jazz bars, and I'm currently working on Josephine Baker, and she obviously was also centred in in Montparnasse. But not, most Parisians never went there. Um, but there are these growing areas of Paris, which will become the red belt of working class um, communities who are really living on the breadline, doing their best to make ends meet working for low wages in very poor housing, generally speaking. And this will be the kind of the troops of the Communist Party that was founded in 1920. That said, however, in this period, it may be that ordinary people weren't privy to the kinds of American contexts that Sarah has been evoking, but they were being encouraged to understand their place in the French Empire. Um, uh, we've seen, I think some people may have come across those banana ads showing a, coloni a colonial theme in, in uh, the black African soldier who's, who's promoting that particular product. Um, in 1930, the centennial of the colonial conquest of Algeria was widely celebrated in France, giving people a sense of belonging to empire. And I think if we can have the next slide, Yes, we have you move along. Yeah. about the colonial yeah. exhibition in 1931. Um, it is the most extraordinary event, and I'm sure, Martin, you know probably much more about it than I do, um, having worked in one of the sites itself of the very, uh, the Cité de l'Immigration, which was at the centre of this exhibition. It attracted about 33 million visitors from across the country, which is remarkable for the time. But it is the most extraordinary thing. Visitors were brought in to sort of, it was like a human zoo to, they, 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 they um, brought in communities, peoples to on display for their consumption, literally, I think. Um, and French people were encouraged to admire their exoticism, which reproduced what they felt was a flavor of, of, the, of the countries they, they came from. 
um, by the organizers. I think the organizers saw it as a celebration of that mission civilisatrice that was the kind of French uh, rationale for colonialism. But there was opposition. And the Surrealists, of course, were part of that. They, they uh, along with some people, some members of the immigrant communities that were present in Paris, they demonstrated, um, uh, supported by the Communist Party. And they even, I think, set up a counter exhibition yeah. trying to point up how the colonial exhibition ignored imperialist ambitions of the French. Um, Soon, also in 1931, I think, if Lee is in Paris, could we have the next slide, please? Um, the beginnings of the Depression are beginning to be felt in 1931 and 32 when she's there. It hasn't done its worst yet, but it's clear from this photograph that um, the unemployment that would hit France, and, it, and, and the Depression did come to France later than it did um, the rest of Europe, that France, the rather archaic nature of French industry meant it was protected for a while, but when it came, it hit hard. Factory closures and unemployment were endemic, and French government me measures were pretty ineffectual on the whole. Immigrants, and there were, there was quite a, a big immigrant community by this time, were laid off first, and women. Um, um, Immigrant labor had been brought in massively to, to feed that um, growth that had happened in the post-war period, um, mainly from Europe, Spain, Belgium, Poland, Polish miners, very important, Eastern European unskilled workers brought in for heavy industry. And their presence played into this increasing polarization we see politically, to come back to your question that you set up, between left and right, which is beginning to, 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 to emerge quite strongly during this period, and is perhaps quite well illustrated in this extremely xenophobic cartoon, if we can see this next slide, that you have passed on to me, Martin. Um, it's quite difficult to read the wording, but la France au français, France for the French, it's quelle invasion de Metec. Now I had to think long and hard about a translation for Metec, and then I thought better of it. It's a very strong uh, xenophobic term for immigrants. Les Turcs, Russes, Chinois, Levantine, Turks, Russians, Chinese, and the people of the Levantine, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, and so on. Ils prennent notre place et mangent notre pain. They're taking our places and eating our bread. Les sociaux les voient de bonne oeil, ce sont les réserves de l'international. So for the socialists, you know, this is what they want, but they are the reserves of the, of the communist international. They are on the side that is obviously being projected and not the side of the speakers. So here we see this real sense that there are two sides emerging. On the right, Action Francaise, which had existed since Dreyf the Dreyfus Affair, fa facing some competition now from other right-wing groups surfacing, the League, notably the Croix de Feu aussi, all of them taking their lead from the success of Italian fascism. The leagues took to the streets already visibly, I think, at this time, um, in violent episodes, beating up people they saw as liberals and socialists. So depression at home aggravates this. And by the early 30s, they're starting to emerge as a growing threat to the Republic. And I think Lee must have been aware when she leaves in 32, she must have had a sense of this rather ominous cloud of growing political and social unease um, that was beginning to mark the French social and political landscape. Yeah, I think that's fascinating because of course, I think that becomes so important in terms of thinking through Lee's political engagement during the 1930s. I think that what you wonderfully evoked there, I mean, it's so interesting that within France in the 1930s, this opposition between a kind of a rooted France that sees itself as being rooted actually in the soil of France, 
versus these cosmopolitans, whether they be bohemian cosmopolitans like Lee Miller or migrants that are coming from, from Italy. And also I have to say from North Africa, I mean, Algeria, mm -hmm. Morocco and Tunisia, it was the largest and the first uh, non-European migration into, into, into Europe. And the, the idea of the word metec, this idea of these people that were not really French because they'd not lived there for hundreds of, uh, of, hundreds of, 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 of years. That's, that's really fascinating. I can't resist that, Hannah, just asking you one question, please, just really about Josephine Baker and about where you would see, I mean, just some sort of parallels or kind of connections with, with what Tony was evoking in terms of, of Lee Miller escaping something by coming to Paris. What, what parallels are there, there with, with Josephine Baker? Do you, do you well, Josephine is very obviously doing something similar. I mean, at this point, she's really beginning to start building her career in Montparnasse, and she's making that move from being an exotic dancer to being actually, you know, she, she acquires skills in a very conscious way. And none of this, none of this would have been possible for her in the States. Um, it, it, just, it just was unthinkable. Um, and there is no doubt that um, her sense of being able to be the person she would become was something she never forgot, forgot that, that the people of Paris supported her and the people of France supported her. And it was because of their liberal values. And, and you know, she was, as Sarah has pointed out, not the only black person to escape America. And there were others who were coming in. We've got sort of this growing community like you know, Césaire, of course, is around this time, just after this time, the, the emergence of a real ideology of, of, of blackness is, is developing. And I think Josephine is sort of one of that, one person in that bigger picture. I think what's interesting there is obviously also the relationship between sort of Paris and jazz. I mean, you could look at later musicians like Miles Davis, who talked absolutely in the same way, but for them, Kind of Paris was a, was a, was a place of freedom in a way which the United States was was not. Okay, right. That that was really fascinating to have that kind of wider portrait and, and context. So, if we could go to to Amy Bouhassain, please. Yeah, sort of. Um, it's really to to ask you, Amy, um, if you could say something really about. Um, this, this, this idea of Paris, you know, Lee being transformed by this Paris moment, kind of, you know, how did, how did, how did it transform her? In, in what ways? Was she a different person by 1932? I think so. I think it's a lot like what Hannah was saying about Josephine Baker, is that Paris gave Lee the space and the freedoms to be able to transform herself and change herself. She was able to leave behind... Lee, the rape victim um, at the age of seven, who had had to lie about her experiences because at that time in America, it was the victim's fault usually, and it would have brought great shame onto her and her family. She was able to leave behind Lee, the daughter, and, and, and these other kind of things that had, had limited her from what she was able to do. I mean, she was had been expelled from school at about four or five times in America because she was had, most of the time because she was just so inquiring and had so much imagination and and challenged the uh, the teachers too much. Um, and then and Paris gave her the space to discover who she really was and to be her in a, in a way her true self. She gave her the chance to build on her experience as being a model. I don't know if you could put up the next slide for me Adam yeah. so it gave it gave her the chance to build on being a, a model and to trans a tra to 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 jump to the other side of the camera oh, yeah. um and um not only that you know she was she was a fast learner and because she had all of the you know or she within a within a year She's kind of working, you know, she's when she arrives, she's working with Man Ray, but then she starts to also working with Hoenig and Hune in, in, in French folk studios. And he'd kind of, and Man Ray help her learn the standards that's expected by 
a, a Vogue photographer and those standards are really high. And by, by the end of her first year in, in Paris, she's appearing on the pages of American Vogue and being published in French Vogue. And then the following year, she also gets published in British Vogue as well. And she sets up her own studio. I mean, doing that it, it, in, in most countries in the early 1930s for a woman is just a pretty tall order. And, you know, because women weren't, weren't allowed, you know, weren't, society didn't allow women to have their own businesses and conduct themselves in this way. But Paris allowed her to have her own studio. And that's on the top left is, is actually her studio stamp from 90 that she used from 1930 to 1932 and it was in the the 14th arrondissement in Montparnasse um, not far from actually Man Ray studio but also interestingly not far from Dora Maar and where she set up her studio too so people are very keen to kind of lump Lee and Man Ray together the whole time she was in Paris but Lee was very independent and and had her you know the, the the photograph below that is her in her own studios those kind of black spots on the walls are actually records that she's pinned there so she's designed and decorated her own room and she's really expressing herself um and and this is the place that she used um as her photographic studio as well um she and she's got surrounding herself by other artists works too do you and, think, Amy, sorry, do you think, Amy, it would be true to say that this is one of the first examples of somebody that moves from being a model, so I suppose having her image defined by somebody else, to somebody that wants to work behind the camera in that way? Was there any precedence for that? I'm sure there probably was, but I haven't heard of one. There's always going to be one other one. <laughs> the minute you say yes, then somebody finds an exception. <laughs> But I, I, I don't know of anybody else um, that, that had done that. I mean, and, she, you know, it, when she was posing for Steichen back in America, he was she'd known him since she was a kid. And he was very generous in kind of letting her see how things work and how she set things up. When she'd been in Paris before in her teens, she'd run away, she ditched her chaperone and run off and joined up with a theatre lighting course with Menges. And so she'd learned kind of lighting in her teens. And then when she'd gone back to America, she actually taught theatre lighting um, at Vassar College before she became a model. So she had all these different bits of experience and being in Paris just allowed her to kind of consolidate them and mold them into who she wanted to be and, and how she wanted to go forward. And she wanted to be a career woman. And I think one of the other things that's, really interesting about her early childhood is that you know although she had an odd relationship with her father he didn't he did treat her the same as her brothers you know there's there's a there's a photograph of her with a black eye where where you know she's got into a fight with her brother um you know she was you know she was always running about in overalls he encouraged her to invent things and to be inventive he gave her a chemistry set at the age of, uh, you know, eight, uh, which is actually one of the reasons one of the reasons she got expelled because she fed fed some chemical to one of her classmates and they peed blue, and it <laughs> but it's that kind of thing that um, you know sh she was always inquiring. She had this amazing um, the technical brain as well, and. Paris gave her the chance to really use it and to to to, to maximise her potential. Can you just briefly, I mean, she leaves in 1932. Could you just briefly explain why? And then how does Paris remain with her when she moves to back to New York? She, le she leaves in 1932 for, for many reasons. Uh, I mean, the most, the, be the best known reason is because Man Ray was becoming... Uh, far too possessive and wanted to kind of own her she'd already turned down his marriage proposal and um but there are other reasons she she, she you know she didn't come from a wealthy background she knows that if she's going to make the move if she's going to continue to be independent and make the move back to america she needs to go there and have work lined up so before she goes she lines herself up with an american dealer 
Julian Levy, who's going to give her a show when she gets there. And she'd met in Paris. She has an offer of work from American Vogue as a fashion photographer for them. And she said she's found her own studio and some backers for it that she's going to set up and 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 um, and launch herself. Adam, can you just click one more? One more. There we go. <laughs> I forgot that's her business card from when she was in Paris. So she she used her Paris kudos and the fact mm. that she knew people. She knew Paris had a reputation in America, and in you know, lit the first you'll see this the um newspaper cutting on the right is the 1st of November. Lee has literally only just left Paris and she's already, there's other articles that are even earlier, is already selling herself in the papers, selling her new studio, selling herself as a portrait photography a photographer. And in the words she's, in, in the way it's worded, it's you know, flaunting the fact that she has this Paris kudos. See, the first one, she goes, Lee has reversed action and returns from Paris as an established photographer of the first water. Um, and, and, and again, each, each article kind of brings home that she has this, this kind of exoticness of this Paris training. So could you just clarify, how is she using Paris here? Because that's... I mean, in a way, there's the Paris of surrealism, there's the Paris of communism, there's the Paris of revolutionary politics. Is that what she's marketing here? Or is it I think she's she's that? using liberal Paris, the, the idea of liberal Paris, and the idea of artistic Paris. And, that, and that's what she's, she's trading on. If you go to the next slide, Adam, um, and click again. She's um, she even in her pay, in her photographs that she's selling through her dealer's gallery, she's she's even signing her pictures Paris. If you can click one more time, Adam, you can see at the bottom here. This is actually these are pictures that she was selling through her dealer's gallery, and actually most of the the photographs that were sold through the gallery at that period all remained in Julian Levy's collection. She's written Lee Miller Paris. She only has written the, the, the city name on those sections of photographs that were sold through the American dealer. No, on none of her other photographs does she write the city. And we've got other pictures, other original photographs from Paris that she signed that weren't sold through America that she hasn't written the name on. So she very clearly knows that this is, this is a, a cachet that is going to appeal to her market. So, and who, and who are the people who buy these photographs? Is that who are the people that take them? Is it, um... I mean, they, they are they are the kind of the artistic um, kind of collectors within within America. We, we're still trying to find out who bought most of them. We'd like to know where they are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what we know is the ones that weren't sold got um, were then co collected by museums later on. So we know of those ones, and every now and then an original one that was sold during her time in New York pops up and it's very exciting for us. So would you say this is true? This is, I mean, in a way she's inventing an idea of Paris or she's playing into an idea of Paris, which is one around fashion, around Coco Chanel, around an association of, of Paris with, with avant-garde luxury items. Yeah, Paris chic. I mean, don't forget this time also, she's been published in American Vogue, with um for the high-end fashion um sometimes advertisements sometimes it is perfume bottles she, she even does a chanel advert um a couple of times as well and then she uses paris again when you know in a different way when she goes with her egyptian husband to live to live in egypt um she it it, it it kind of turns into it, it enables her to engage and she becomes a really key part of the um, Egyptian surrealist group and their early years when they formed. The the lady in the bottom right corner there is um, Amy Namir, who is a member of the Art and Liberty Egyptian surrealist group that Lee knew. Amy Namir was an artist in her own right and she'd known Dali and she was also connected to the surrealists but Lee was the kind of strongest 
connection to the French surrealists. Um, and because of Lee, she they were she was able to kind of she was constantly writing to Roland Penrose, who was sending her information, and she was also writing to to others. I mean, um, and he was feeding her back kind of the Cahiers d'Art and other surrealist pu publications and that she was able to share with them. And she was integral in the in the formation and, and the grouping together of the Art and Liberty group in, in Egypt and that became the surrealist group. That's really fascinating. I mean, could you just sort of, um, what you've just said is really interesting, but could you just sort of, I say, succinctly summarise kind of what happens to Lee really between kind of, in a way with a Julian Levi show that's what, 34? So, so what happens between 34 and the outbreak of World War II? What, what, what's kind of, I mean, it's a fascinating entangled story, but I just want to kind of, so that all the, everybody watching. In really, oh, really oh. succinctly. <laughs> <laughs> so she, she marries Aziz, <laughs> she moves to Egypt. She, for the first time in her life, she doesn't have to work. And, and that gives her complete freedom to photograph things and, and to allow her surrealist eye to just take off. And some of her most famous surrealist pictures will learn from here. But then in 1937, she's back in Paris. And this mm. is Paris is, comes back again. Um, her husband, her Egyptian husband, Aziz, saw that she was unhappy and missing her artistic friends. Mm. He sends her back to Paris. I mean, poor guy. If he'd known that that night she was going to go on to a fancy dress party and and meet Roland Penrose, and and then have an affair with him for two years and then leave him to go and live in London, then maybe he might not have been so nice and bought the ticket. But he he was actually a fantastic guy, um, as he and he, when when Lee did leave him in 1939, he was incredibly generous and he gave. Lee a portfolio of shares uh, because he said that he wanted her to always be able to be independent and to never have to rely on on a man f um, financially, which is a wonderful thing if you're suddenly being you if you're being dumped like that. <laughs> but yeah, so she left him and she arrives in England um, just before World War Two breaks out. Can we go to the next slide, Adam? <clears throat> And um, this, she, she, as a woman American in, in England, she's not allowed to work. So she volunteers to start off with. And I think that there's a real reason why she stayed in America. Uh, I mean, stayed in, in England. And she, this is summed up really nicely in this letter. Can you click one more time, Adam? She writes to her older brother, John. He's the one that gave her the black eye. Um, <laughs> and they had a good, they did have a, a, a love-hate relationship. But in this one, she, they, they, or she jokes with him the most. But in this one, she's talking to him about why, why she stayed. Because she, you know, very quickly after Britain declared war, she got a letter from America saying, you know, come back. You're in danger. We're not part of the war. Your, your life's in danger. But she, she stays. And, um, you know, she says it in her letter. It's, it's the obvious question is, why do I stay here? It's not entirely that I'm waiting for you, but maybe I have a cause. I don't know just what it is, but something to do with the fact that years ago, I fought and struggled to live in Europe, chose my friends in these countries and their way of living. So I can't leave just because there isn't enough butter to go around. And maybe the work I'm doing will buy a gun. And that's that's the root of it. That's that's what drove her and made her stay in England. And it, you can there's a huge heartbreak when f for her and frustration in, that you can see in her other letters when Paris falls and is occupied as well. I just draw your attention to the solarized picture in the middle there. That's um, another example of her using a technique that she used in Paris as well. Right, that was fascinating. I mean, particularly fascinating her, her kind of pivotal kind of role in surrealism within within Kaya and the and the kind of Arab world is absolutely kind of uh, uh, really, really fascinating. I want to sort of now sort of move on really to think about the war years and particularly about this sort of second moment, transformative moment in 44 to, to 45. Um, 
you've talked about the kind of her her kind of sort of the impact that that, that sort of the fall of, of Paris France has 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 on her. I mean, how would you summarize that, Amy? How would you sort of see? How does she live that experience? How does that feel for her? She she gets frustrated. She wants she kind of she writes another letter to her brother, telling him to get his boots on and come over and help. <laughs> um, she feels like she's not doing enough, but she knows she can't do anything else. Right, Sarah, sort of, could, could you sort of, in a way now, kind of, what happens to France during the war? And, um, uh, uh, yeah, what, 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 what then happens to Lee during the war as well in terms of becoming a, a sort of journalist with Vogue? But in particular, if you summarise, what happens to France now in the sort of, in the, in the light of um, the fall of France of 1940? I mean, in a, in a very, very brief, reduced, tiny nutshell, um, France gets split up. Uh, so there's... Sorry, so you just need to come closer into the mic so can you... Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so in a, in a nutshell, um, France gets split up. Paris, for example, is in the occupied part of France, the, the German-occupied part of France, and then in the south you have the Vichy France. Um, in terms of like a broader context of, of French empire, um, in, in West Africa, um, Félix de Boetel uh, rallies behind de Gaulle, who's gone to London and set up a kind of free French uh, sort of state, the idea that, you know, real, the real France, the, the France of the revolution of 1789 has not fallen. So, so you'll need to come in just closer to your mic because we can't quite hear Okay, can special. you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so essentially I was alluding to the fact that France has fallen as a, as a country on a map it doesn't exist in the same way anymore, um, but it, it does exist as an idea, right? And I think this is this really is important to Lee Miller and Lee Miller's experience. So de Gaulle is uh, is based in in London, and Free France therefore is is headquartered in London. And many of, whilst many of uh, Lee Miller's uh, friends, many of the artists and, and photographers and models, etc., that she knew in in Paris are still there. Many of them become part of the, the resistance movement in, um, in Paris. I can't know so, so you have that. to move into the mic because we can't hear you. You have to move right near to the screen because I couldn't quite hear what you said. I'm there. afraid I, I really of... can't be any closer to it. It's <laughs> so yeah. right here. Yeah, that's um, fine, yeah. Okay, so um, I'm essentially just saying that um, uh, many of, of Lee's friends are, are trapped essentially in Paris. Um, so those who who have got out in time. Um, some of them have ended up, many of the surrealists ended up in New York, uh, for example. Uh, quite a few also uh, ended up in, in London uh, during the war. So I think uh, for, for Lee, there's this constant reminder of, of the France that was before the war. She's involved in a lot of the artistic movements in, in the UK and in London. There's a, a surrealist inspired uh, publication called the London Bulletin, where many of the people that are part of the surrealist movement, so people like Paul Eluard, Louis Allegon, uh, their work is republished there and Lee's photography appears uh, there. So it, it's very much she's part of keeping alive that spirit of surrealism and these movements and artists that, um, you know, were there before the war that was so significant in the interwar period. You know, she's part of that movement. Uh, in terms of her role as a photographer for, for British Vogue, I think there's, there's a really interesting quote from Audrey Withers, who's essentially, I think, her boss at Vogue at the time. And, and she says that Vogue's job during the war is, is an extension of what she says is women's first duty, which is to practice the arts of civilization so that in happier times, they will not fall into disuse. So Vogue at this time has taken on the mantle of, you know, continuing what it means to be, you know, British, these, these kind of cultures so that, you know, when the war ends, the whole thing hasn't disappeared. And to a certain extent, Lee is, is part of that, but I think she's also incredibly important in, in documenting uh, women's experiences uh, of, of the war in, in London and the UK. And I think that that is really crucial. Okay. And in terms of like, you have um, 
D-Day that takes place on the 6th of June 1944, the invasion of France and which will lead to the liberation of Europe. Um, Lee becomes a, a war photographer for, for, for Vogue. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there were three images that you wanted to talk to. What did you want to say about them? So Adam, if you could move on to the next image, please. Yeah, absolutely. So this this first one is is from 1944. It's at Saint Laurent sur Mer. It's an airstrip in Normandy, and this is uh, this is Lee's first trip to France as a war photographer. And to kind of to kind of uh, backpedal a little bit, um, she's given permission or the accreditation to be a war photographer. Um, by the supreme headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Forces. Many of her male photo photographer friends who are working, say, for example, for the American publication Life, so people like uh, David Sherman, um, they've got these accreditation much, much earlier. And when she gets it and she gets permission to go, Normandy is where she goes first. And the 44th Evacuation Hospital, where the, the men in this picture are being evacuated from, is the first place she goes and this is you know this is quite traumatic uh, for Lee you know she sees a lot of suffering there's a lot of injury um, and she talks about the sort of horror of seeing people in in this kind of pain um, in her I think it's her second her return to to France uh, as this kind of photographer she's in Brittany and Saint-Malo and whilst Hollywood for example makes a lot of the idea of the girl the intrepid girl reporter the reality is that uh, women uh, journalists during this time period are not, they're very restricted in, in where they can go, but accidentally um, Lee ends up in a kind of combat zone because Saint Malo is not as uh, controlled by allied forces uh, as it was thought to be. And so she's actually sort of there on the ground as they um, sort of con confront, I think it's a, a Colonel von uh, Orlok who's having a kind of last stand in this, in this area. And so she has, she takes a series of incredible photographs um, that, you know, that capture really what it's like. And I, I believe she's, you know, one of the very few women in this area because it, it's primarily soldiers. It's a kind of live site. Um, and she, you know, she gets into quite a bit of trouble for this um, because she, you know, the, the Supreme Allied Expeditionary Force headquarters that I, that I mentioned earlier, you know, after, after Lee's, you know, found to be there, they send around a memo saying that no women photographers or journalists are to be anywhere near this zone in the, or any kind of live action zone in the future. So it, it's incredibly significant. I mean, she captures, I think, the first instance of the Americans uh, using napalm. Um, and I think that that is a, you know, that's an incredibly important thing. And there's this, there's this quote from, so David Sherman, who's her friend, when he sort of finds her after this, he says that, you know, he's very critical of her. He says, well, she looks like a, an unmade, unwashed bed at this point because she's been in the same uniform, the same clothes, right? And I think this, this sort of tells us something as well. Like, I don't think she's a woman who is usually very well coiffed. You know, she's a woman for whom style has been an incredibly important part of her life, right? She's very good, as, as Amy has just been telling us, at, at selling herself, at branding herself, at selling Paris. And this is a really different new stage of her life where she is seeing firsthand this suffering. She herself is not exactly living a, a decadent and luxurious life, you know, taking these photographs and being alongside the soldiers. And I think that there's something there's something really interesting and important about that. And she, you know, after she's been <laughs> sent out of this zone, she ends up in Paris and she, she actually, you know, runs into some of her old friends, including, I think, um, Pablo Picasso, who says, you know, you're the first GI soldier I've seen and it's, you're a woman, <laughs> you know? Do you want to speak about the other photo images that you selected from the archive as well? Yeah, absolutely. So. Adam, if you could move on. Yeah, so this is, this is actually a photo that was taken in 1946. Um, and it's of, it's of a, Cuban, uh, a Cuban artist called Wilfredo Lam. And I selected this because I think it's, it's, a, it's an extraordinary, I think it's an extraordinary photo. It's a very dapper photo of, of Wilfredo Lam, but also because it's an indication of um, 
the the surrealist movement. I mean, Wilfredo Lem uh, came to Paris, I, I believe. So he was in Spain uh, first and learning with uh, people like Picasso. He comes to Paris after Lee has left. Um, he's incredibly innovative and avant-garde artist who becomes involved with um, some of the cultural movements that Hannah mentioned. So for example, uh, Aimé Césaire, Leopold Sédar Senghor, who are you know, considered some of the, the fathers of the, the political and cultural movement of Negritude. Um, Wilfred Olam becomes involved uh, with that. He's involved with their very famous wartime journal, uh, Tropique in Martinique. And he's an example, I think, of a broader context. And I spoke um, before about you know, the, the, the roots of, of Lee's friends under German occupation. Some people stayed in Paris, others got out. Wilfred Olam um, with André Breton uh, and a few others went down to Marseille and eventually um, fled uh, to, back to the Americas via Martinique. And so I think this is an interesting reflection of sort of the dynamics of this moment and where Lee's broader networks uh, are going. And Adam, if you could just uh, flick to the next photo. So this is a, this is a portrait of two close friends of, of Lee Miller's, um, Louis Aragon and uh, his wife, Elsa Triolet. Um, and they were, they were actually neighbors of Lee and uh, Mann, Ray Mann, uh, when at the, when in the early 1930s, sort of late 1920s in, in Montparnasse. And Louis Aragon is a key leader of the Surrealist movement. And Elsa Triolet is a sort of Russian emigre to France. They were close friends of Lee Miller. And Elsa Triolet becomes in 1944, the first woman to win the Prix Goncourt. Right, so this is an incredibly, this is, this is a photograph that Lee's taken of two dear friends, but also of two incredibly important uh, artists uh, in this moment and in this period. And you know, she reflects um, when she sees them again on just how thin they are, you know, because they, they, they stayed in, in Paris under, under occupation. And you know, for her, it's an indication they're frail, they're thin. This has not been an easy period for them, you know, um, uh, Aragon had been part of the Communist Party. They'd both been part of the resistance. Um, and this was an example, in contrast to her frustrations of not being able to be involved, I think she had a lot of admiration for the friends that had stayed and had resisted in whatever ways had been possible. Right, thanks. That was really, really interesting. Really, really fascinating. Could we just now move to you, I suppose, Anna, Hannah and, and Amy. It's really about, about her photography which, which kind of Sarah's introduced around the liberation of, 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 of France and, 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 and Paris. Um, so I don't know if you, we could move to the next slide, please. Yes, Adam. well, I've chosen this. I mean, um, Lee's pictures, this, this is, uh, Lee was in Rennes while she was waiting. She was very frustrated because she couldn't be in the thick of it with the American armies and she finds herself in Rennes. And while she's there, she does, come across these um, women whose heads have been shaved, something which was happening across the country, really, in the aftermath of the, you know, sort of the great joyous celebrations at the departure of the German armies. Um, and I'm very interested in crowds at the liberation. Some crowds at the liberation were kind of rec Republican crowds that carried that sense of a return of the Republic and the power of the Republic. But this is a very different crowd. You can see here, you can see here the men jeering at these women who are su suspected of, of, of collaboration and, and even some very young boys here. We can see their faces in this image. And I think one of the really valuable things about Lee's body of work for historians of this period is the extent to which she commentates her images. So she gives us these pictures, but she also narrates them. She narrates them in her letters. She narrates them also in the articles that she writes to go along with them. So we have a really quite a clear idea of not what's just happening in the frame, but what's going on outside the frame. And about this picture, she tells us that she comes happens upon these girls actually, and she's raced ahead of them to get the picture and everyone, because she's in her uniform that, that, that she had made, everyone assumes she's the person who's actually uh, uh, found these women and arrested them. And she's being congratulated. 
And at the same time as these women are being jeered at and 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 I think we give we get this kind of real picture of of these contradictions of what's going on in this liberation moment. Um, and if you look at the next picture, which I think is a, is a picture of the same image, somehow Lee's got herself into a po position that she's above the crowd. And she's literally, in a sense, I think, I am above this, you know, I am not involved in this activity. But what is also really telling in this part of the image is the women. And I have seen many, many, many pictures of women whose heads have been shaved. Sometimes we know who's taken them, sometimes but they're by allied, allied soldiers, sometimes we know where there are. they are. But here we can see that there are many, Lee has taken this and there are many women in the picture and that is quite unusual to my mind. The women were so caught up sometimes in these crowds. Um, Okay, so she does that day, only we think that day or the next day, finally make it to Paris. And she's very pleased about that. I think we think it's around about the 27th or 28th of August. So the actual drama of the resistance battles and the withdrawal of the Germans has passed by the time she gets there. And Lee writes to Audrey Withers, editor of Vogue, saying, I won't be the first woman journalist in Paris by any means, but I'll be the first dame photographer. And she is determined to chronicle her vision of Paris. The fighting's over, but the festivities are ongoing. And if we can have the next picture, she does give us a, a sense of the feeling of how those festivities look and how it feels. And I love this picture of the victory celebrations at the Maison Paquin, because we are there. We are in Lee's shoes. We are looking up at this building and we are seeing the faces of those women, women hanging out of the windows. Importantly, I think it, this photo reminds us much, historians have written much about de Gaulle's famous speech at the Mairie de Paris a few days earlier, where he emotionally talks about how Paris liberated herself and made no acknowledgement to the not insignificant part played by the Allies, of course. And here we see here clearly how, as elsewhere in the capital, there is an acknowledgement of the part played by the Allies. The flags are there. Yes, the tricolore, the French flag, but also the American flag and the British flag. And, and really across Paris, buildings were decked out in this way. People spent time sewing their own flags. Um, in the museum uh, that, that I've been involved in, the Musée de la Libération, there's a wonderful liberation dress that someone has sewn. And, and, you know, we can see these women in this um, Maison Couturière, this, 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 this fashion house, they had what they needed to be sewing these wonderful flags. And then finally, this last photo, which I think also captures for us very um, intensively another facet of those celebrations of the liberation. Um, Lee has called this Les Mademoiselles uh, avec les GIs. Um, I think we get a sense again, these three women, they're all in the same dress. They've been planning this for weeks. They've probably made the dresses themselves. It's not in color, but they could be red, white, and blue, couldn't they? Um, and I think, um, we see a sense of Lee's portraiture here. We can see the girls' face, the world women's faces. They're communicating with these Americans. We're not quite sure how. There's this sense of interaction going on and, and there's movement in the picture. And these other women that you can't quite see, the slides um, cut it out here, but looking on, I think somewhat enviously. Um, Lee draws our attention into the uh, text she writes to accompany this picture to the simplicity of their makeup, um, the self-styled hair, the, the, the way in which they've done their hair, 
but they've done it in a quite simple way, the straightforward look of that fashion. And she pitches this as a kind of taunt to show up the recently departed uniform Nazi women who wore these really sober souris uh, gris, you know, they, they, they wore these very, the, the, the women in uniform, very sober looking. So the much gayer look here. And Lee suggests that women and others like them when making their dresses, erred on the side of generosity in using the material, they used as much as they could so the Germans couldn't have it. Um, so that they benefited, so that even sometimes wasting that material, a kind of little gesture of resistance, if you like. And I think the value of Lee's commentaries and the images she has left us as historians, is she offers us insights into these into these rebellious areas that we'd otherwise easily, I think, just not be aware of and we'd miss out. Yeah, thank you, Hannah. That was really, really interesting. And I think it's um, I mean, it's certainly true, obviously, about, about the way in which de Gaulle <clears throat> almost immediately invented a kind of myth about the liberation of France that had been liberated by France and that the role of the Allies had been negligible. Also, the role of French imperial troops. I mean, the way in which that was airbrushed out of history, the role of the Senegalese, um, uh, the Moroccans and the Algerians in liberating France, which had been sort of so, so sort of pivotal. Right, it's fascinating. Amy, could, could we just go to you now to sort of talk really about... I mean, you talked about what, what the fall of Paris meant for Lee in 1940. What did the liberation of Paris mean to her in 1944, four long years later? It meant an incredible, uh, incredible amount of different emotions. I think there was joy, but then there and, re and relief. Adam, can I have the next slide, please? So there, there's an incredible amount of joy and, and relief, but then there's, uh, and you know, to see, to see it free. Um, and to find her friends but then there's a lot of grief as well like uh, you know because some had died some had suffered some were missing and they still didn't know where they were um, so she she attended things like the the funeral of of the the free french which is this bottom right hand corner image with picasso and um Eluard and aragon and the pierre lachasse cemetery so she was, she was there and she's discovering the real subversion that had happened with neighbours turning in neighbours, um, the real suffering that her friends like the Eluards had had um, as part of the resistance. I mean, they spent the last six months of the occupation hiding in a mental asylum. They'd, it, they'd spent some other times hiding in rafters and starving. Um, and the, the heartbreak of, of seeing had this place that was so dear to her and what had happened to it. And she wants to dig deeper too. She goes off and hangs out with a, with a family that had been in hiding and eats their rations and writes about how their daughter looks at her with disgust when she finds it really difficult to eat the cracker that they've given her to, to eat and that she says tastes absolutely repulsive. And the daughter's kind of wanting to eat it. But but minding her manners, um, and but th then she but then also she's working for a fashion magazine, and it's her duty to um, to report on the fashion. And like Hannah said, she writes about how to waste was 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 pa was patriotic because that was against the, what the Germans were doing. To have these amazing hairdos, I call that lady in the top right corner donut head lady because it's like she's got two donuts on the front of her head. But it's just a minute. She's a Fifi, uh, a free French um, lady, and, and so to record these, and she's she's so interested to find out what what people have done, what the resistance have done, what normal people have done to stand up. Um, in their own little way to make a difference. And if we could go to the next slide. Um, and she's, so she's asked by British Vogue to use Paris from that point onwards as her base, and she does. Uh, and they, they ask her, obviously, they, they're desperate. Britain and America are desperate to see what French, what's happened in French fashion because they'd not seen anything. 
Um, so straight away, she's looking up friends of hers like Chaparelli. Chaparelli wasn't there initially, but she'd left her studio boss. So she got access to her stuff. And then when Chaparelli did come, she covers her her new um, line of clothing because um, Lee and her were friends. So she's she's covering that. She's sending that back to Britain and America. And the British had such a violent reaction towards it because he, they saw these women with these you know, they'd gone through years of austerity and short skirts and scrimping and saving and make do and mend. And here is these kind of luscious, long pleated dresses using lots and lots of material. And they made they made the mistake of publishing them without explaining that this was an act of resistance. And that's why they, they had this amount of material. Although a lot of the times it, the dress that the model's wearing is the only example of what of what there was um but lee's so desperate to help france and uh, to help paris and and to help french vogue relaunch that she's in based in hotel scribe and she'll go off and report on on the battle so she'll go off to to alsace during the winter and cover the fighting there and other battles of the bulge and and but in between comes back to paris to do a couple of fashion shoots and send a few more dispatches and then there's also the problem of the models, who to use. She really felt strongly against using um, ones that had been collaborators or were suspe even suspected of being it. But there's other models whose partners were missing, who had been or who had been taken by the Nazis. And obviously Germany was was the Allies still hadn't got into Germany, so they were at risk. So there's a massive minefield of who is even going to pose in the clothes. And there's no electricity in Paris initially as well because there's no coal. But she's also wants people to fall in love with Paris again. So she's taking these pictures like the, the couple running in front of the Eiffel Tower there. And Adam, if you can click again for me and another time. See, these are appearing in, uh, in the, the, this, these, this, she's reigniting the romantic vision of Paris and sending that out over the world and actually even to France because Cadran, although it was published in, uh, it, it was a, an allied publication, it was published in France, in French and distributed in France. This is the back cover of, of the fourth edition of the magazine. That's really interesting, the extent to which, I mean, all of these kind of images, the kind of contradictory messages that they kind of transmit or give off. But in a way, as in you were talking earlier within New York, that now she is actually projecting an image of Paris that actually the world is really thirsty for and you kind of like almost feeding it and kind of sort of perpetuating it. Would that, yeah. would that be true? Yeah, I think so. I think she loves it so much and she's so joyful that it's free again and that she's back there again and she wants to do her bit so she she is she's now becoming part of the myth she's now going to build on it and she's going to kind of push that romantic vision of, of Paris okay All right that's really 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 interesting could you just say I mean we're coming to Tony in a minute could you say so she's now working doing the fashion shots, but then alternating that with actually working on the front line in Alsace-Lorraine and in the Battle of the Bulge in, in December 1940, 1944. Uh, I, mean, I mean, is that an easy thing to, to do? That, that, uh, that... No, it's, quite, it's quite schizophrenic. Just kind of, I mean, she was also at the liberation of Luxembourg. She was in Belgium. She was all over the place. Um, you know, but always going eventually back to Paris to submit her, you know, to, to write up her notes or she'd write them up on the way and then she'd send them off and then she'd do a bit more fashion. Because the liberation um, edition of French Vogue didn't come out until January 1945. Right, right. I think one of the things that's really interesting about her, her reporting and the photographs, obviously, as I understand it, Vogue would have been a monthly publication. So that's a different dynamic to those mm -hmm. journalists which were being expected to produce something on a daily basis, the way that did allow her to do something that was possibly more forensic or more kind of digging 
digging deeper to find the kind of hidden stories in terms of 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 of, of this of this of, the, of this moment. Yeah, and, and um, British Vogue and American Vogue had slightly different submission dates. And American Vogue was slightly later. So, and I mean, the clearest example is actually when she covers is is later when she covers the liberation of Denmark. She, she her notes are stolen. And um, so she has to rewrite it and doesn't manage to get much information. She only manages to get about three or four pages of manuscript to British Vogue in time for their publication. But she manages to get the type up the rest and get another 20 pages to them in time for American Vogue. And they do a much more kind of fulsome, fulsome article. So these would have been some of the first images that people both in Britain and America would have seen of, of, of Paris post the liberation. And particularly the women, because mm. in this particular time in Britain, women didn't read the newspapers. And that was why a publication like Vogue was so important to women, uh, uh, to the war effort, because, you know, the women um, the women's war effort was huge and in, uh, in keeping Britain going you know, Britain at home going. And they were, you know, Lee was doing, before she went to Europe, she was doing articles, many, many articles that encouraged and tried to make fashionable things like short hair because women were getting their hair caught in in, fa in, in the cogs and things in factories and scalping themselves or, or, or actually getting seriously injured. Okay. <clears throat> right, thank you. That, that was really interesting, really fascinating. Okay, can we just return now to Tony, please, for the sort of the kind of final section? And can you just explain to us about about how Lee Miller goes to 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 Germany, and um, in a way, her coverage of the kind of final downfall of the of the of the, of the, of the Nazi regime? Just to unmute yourself, Tony, please. Yeah. Here we go. And can I have a first? No, I don't have the first slide up yet, Adam. Um, yeah, Lee crossed into Germany uh, with with the Allies probably in early April, and she <clears throat> went into Aachen, and then she just kept going with the U.S. Army as it fought its way east. And <clears throat> at some point, she made a significant decision with her buddy David Sherman not to go north to Berlin but to carry on heading east. And I think the rationale, certainly the way that Sherman put it was, everybody else is going north. Everybody else is going to Berlin. Let's see what's happening in Munich, because this was the birthplace of the Nazi ideology. And also they knew that Hitler had his Alpine headquarters out at Ober Salzburg. So they headed for Munich. <clears throat> and that of course put them straight in line for Buchenwald and Dachau, and other concentration camps which were being liberated at that time. So when she got through to Munich, and this is the time for the next slide. Yes, I the next slide, please, yeah. She actually, with Sherman, found her way to a very, very smart billet. It was the only place, the only, only house in, um, in, in Munich that still had coal uh, <clears throat> because it happened to be Hitler's house. And they found that they had hot water and this was such a rarity. Sherman told me they had not had their clothes off in three weeks at this point. And so there was hot water, there was soap, there was towels, and they just couldn't resist it. And Lee hopped in the tub. And then they realized they had a scoop. Well, you can see the way Lee is posing. She's crouched down because she knows that if the photograph shows her breasts, it's not gonna be printed in any of the magazines or papers. So they were deliberately setting the shot up to be a magazine picture. Then they wanted to signal how they felt about being in Hitler's tub. So you see the little kitsch sculpture on the right, that's by a sculptor called Rudolf Kasbeck, who was a great sort of buddy of all the Nazis because he did these kind of uh, really sort of stiff, ugly kind of uh, conventional poses. And I think she put it there because it was a reaction to the fact that Hitler had had this uh, exhibition of degenerate art in Munich in 1937, which showed one of her greatest buddies, Max Ernst. And so I think she's saying here, okay, Hitler, 
if this is your taste in art, it sucks, you know, give me seriality. And the most important thing in the picture though, here of the, of the setups is the photograph. Uh, Adam, can you give me the next picture? This is a photograph by Hitler's um, pet photographer, um, Heinrich Hoffmann, a, a revolting specimen himself. And he made this image, which actually became the kind of key Nazi icon. Next one, Adam. And the next one. And it was replicated right across Germany with the, the line, Ein Volk, Ein Reich, Ein Führer, Großer Deutschland. One people, one state, one leader, great Germany. And frankly, it chills me to the marrow to hear morally bankrupt populist leaders using that kind of phraseology all over the world at this moment. But actually, it's not the photos that are the real key to this image. Adam, can we click again? The key is, you go again, one more, is the boots. Now, the morning of this day, these boots carried Lee Miller around Dachau concentration camp as she witnessed the liberation. And the war had become very personal to Lee when she came through Paris because so many of her friends were missing. Many of her friends were Jewish. The fashion industry was run with Jewish people, Jewish seamstresses, and they were gone. So many of them were gone. Anybody who was a dissident, anybody who was a communist, they were gone. And so as Lee was going around Dachau, she was looking into the faces of the dead and the dying to see if any of them were her missing friends. Now she's sitting in Hitler's tub and those boots are stamping the filth, the degradation, the ash, the vileness of Dachau into Hitler's nice clean bath mat. Can you click again, Adam? That's symbolic. But actually, there's something that you can't see in this image, which is way across Germany at 4.45 this afternoon, Hitler and Eva Braun had killed themselves. Lee is not sitting in that tub as Hitler's guest. She's a victor. And that is a key difference. Well, the shot goes on from here. Can I have the next shot, Adam? Because she hopped out and then, next one, Sherman gets in. You can see the boots are different. You can see his clothes are on top of hers. You can see Kazbek's little sculpture and the photograph is still in the same place. But the key difference is Lee has tilted up to include the shower head because that morning they had been looking at communal shower baths in Dachau which were actually gas chambers disguised as shower bars. And so here is Sherman sitting underneath the head of a shower and Sherman was Jewish. There is such a massive metaphor and hidden meaning in that image. Everybody thinks it's just a spectacular picture of Lee in Hitler's tub, but actually the way she organized it, the way she stacked up the clues inside that picture make it an enormously important image and in a way a surreal image because all the action is beneath the surface. That's right. Do you want to just say, I mean that is absolutely fascinating, do you want to just say a little bit more to, to the people sort of watching this that, um, um, do you say a little bit about who Sherman was, who David Sherman was and the sort of yes, certainly. relationship with Lee Miller? <clears throat> David E. Sherman was actually already a highly distinguished Life magazine correspondent when he arrived in London in 1942. And he and Lee became buddies. He was quite a lot younger than Lee, about 11 years younger, but they became buddies and they were very close. And it became a menage a trois with Roland and Sherman and Lee, because Roland was by then a captain in the British army and he was away from home and there were still bombs falling on London. And he wanted there to be somebody around Lee who loved her as much as he did to take care of her. And he knew that Sherman would go to any lengths to look after her. And then of course, they didn't go to Europe together, 
but very quickly they met up. Sherman found her in the siege of San Marlo. Uh, he was going through the sort of blasted streets filled with rubble. And this boy says, hey, mister, take my picture, put it in the paper. That was the, that was the kind of GI call to the, the journalist. And because it was Lee. And she'd been there for five days before he arrived. And so they became this incredible duo, crossing Europe together, looking out for each other, helping each other as much as they could. And that lasted right up more or less until this moment, because May the 8th, about a week after this picture, uh, the war ended, and Life magazine dragged Sherman back to the United States. And that meant Lee was on her own, and I think very lonely in a way. Afterwards, Sherman and my father remained the closest of friends, and Sherman became one of the most important people in my life. Why was that? Why was that? Why did he become an important person in your life? Because he was incredibly supportive. When we discovered the Lee Miller archive, um, we invited him to come. He was coming to Europe anyway. And he came and he just told us what was what and what things were. And he was incredibly helpful. He then wrote the foreword for Lee Miller's War, which is actually what we were going to publish first. Then when I started writing Lives of Lee Miller, he sat with me. I mean, he was in America, but I used to send him each chapter as I finished it. And by return of post, it would come back with neat little pencil marginalia all the way through it. And he was so encouraging, so encouraging. You know, he said the most wonderful things to me. He said, after I'd finished the chapter on Dachau, he said, I can't believe you weren't there. You made it so vivid. And I thought, well, thanks, but actually that's because I've been talking to you so much. At the beginning of the, of the, of the conversation, we talked about this idea of bearing witness and that being kind of something that was sort of important for Lee. What, what, what impact do you think, seeing what she saw in Germany in 1945, what, what did that have upon her, do you think? Upon her? Yeah. Nearly lethal. The impact was such that she was suffering in post-war years acutely from what we would today call post-traumatic stress disorder. But they didn't have a name then. You know, it was not really understood. And the idea was you put up and you shut up and you drank a lot of whiskey. And she did drink and she became very alcohol dependent. Uh, and it was probably the worst chapter of her life because she just, I think, could not come to terms with the, the destruction, the loss of her friends, the guys that had been tortured to death in these death camps. And it, it must have weighed very, very heavily on, it, on her. I mean, I, we in the archive know just how, how corrosive long and sustained contact with the images are. What it was like to be there actually for real must have been must have been absolutely devastating. But the most incredible thing was that, that she had the resilience and she had the willpower to claw her way up out of this. And she eventually, she, she got off the booze and reinvented herself as this amazing surrealist gourmet cook. Now, as I understand it, one of those was about her going to Paris in the late 1950s. Well, indeed, she did go to Paris. Roland got the job of being the British Council representative in Paris, and this really suited them both because a friend lent them a wonderful flat and they had lots of time over there. And Lee went and did a Cordon Bleu course and she looked up all her French friends and she just had a most wonderful time. She felt she was home. You know, she I, I, I was over here in England. I was in, in school by that time and she didn't have to look after me and, and and she I think regained a little tiny bit of that freedom that she felt when she walked those streets as a teenager saying baby I'm home. So in a way it was there the idea of Paris as a saviour city for her? A safe haven yes and a missing part of her psyche that could not be fed and nurtured in any other place. 
that's fascinating. Okay, that's that's really, really interesting, really, really fascinating. I think um, what I want to do now is is really just sort of um, to to kind of um, return to each of our speakers and to get them to sort of like really think about it. We've looked at these two, we've explored these two kind of seminal moments in, in kind of Lee Miller's life um, in Paris in 29 to 32, and then in the liberation of, of Western Europe in 44 and 45. And I suppose really, I'd like to, eat, or would like to ask each speaker what, what they think kind of um, stands out for them in terms of what these two moments did for for, for Lee and um, it's quite a lot to ask but I'd be really interested to find out your kind of like reflections and is it okay if we start start with you Anna please you just want to say something what what do you think these two moments like having heard what you've heard from the discussion the conversation what what do you feel stands out for you in terms of these two moments me. sorry Martin life? I didn't hear did you say me yeah yeah Hannah please yeah Hannah died. yeah um well, I think one of the things that sort of leapt out for me, um, looking through the photos uh, at the archive and from what we've heard today, is how Lee has been able, even as a foreign foreigner, to bring us these insights about the French and about France and about yeah. Paris. Um, and, and I think it's really striking um, the way in which she is identifies with French culture and French life um, and is able to not just, I mean, you know, particularly we've talked a lot about Paris today, but, but, but she has got this eye for picking up people's express expressions and ways of being. And, and I think that, that that's a gift that she really cultivated and developed and it clearly started young. I think Amy told me she first went to, to, to Paris when she was a teenager and, and, and she sort of, you know, I can empathize with that. Um, she, she sort of felt this, this bond with Paris and she uses Paris throughout her life as, 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 as Tony says, this safe haven. And she comes back and during that war period when she's at Hotel Scribe and there's this whole buzz of activity around her with other war correspondents and war photographers and she's going off on these missions, as Tony said, to Luxembourg and, and, and seeing, seeing the battlefield again and seeing these terrible sights that Paris is very central and a kind of grounding moment for her, I think. And, and it's, 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 it's this... This, this story of her also finding French cooking is her safe haven too, is, is I think very telling. Yeah, and well, what do you think, you, you talked about the idea that what Lee Miller did is that she, as somebody who was an outsider, but who developed definitely a kind of, she became a kind of, I mean, I don't know, what is it that's, that's said about, you know, if you live in Paris before the age of 25, then it becomes sort of you for the rest of your life or part of you for the rest of your life. Um, I think it was Hemingway that said that. I mean, is it, is it, but what, what were the insights do you think that she brought to thinking about Paris through her photographs as a kind of outsider? Oh dear, that's a big question. Um... The insights. I mean, I think she she understood space. She uses it. I was really interested in Amy's pictures, the way she uses the Eiffel Tower. Um, you know, she knows and she knows how the way she uses Paris, she sells Paris, doesn't she? She she kind of, as we saw in the first part of our conversation, she uses it almost as a way of marketing herself. Um, I have to think about that one, Martin, I think. Okay, okay. And I was just very struck in the, the images of the women of the shaved heads. I mean, there, the photographs are revealing some very ugly truths about the liberation that was being experienced, this joyful moment, but the idea of retribution and revenge. Um, I mean, that was quite yes. a courageous thing to do, it seems to me. Yes, I mean, most of the pictures of head-shaven women actually were taken by Allied soldiers and by outsiders. There are some people, 
you know, people did, weren't allowed to use cameras. So a lot of people didn't have cameras there. There are some taken by French people and some that appeared on postcards, but the vast majority of images that I've seen in collections are not taken by French people. That's really, really interesting. That's really, really interesting. Okay. Sarah, what did you, what did you want to say really in terms of from this conversation, what do you feel about these two <laughs> moments in Lee Miller's life? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I think, I mean, I, I agree with um, Hannah's analysis. And I, I would add to that that, you know, one of the things that really strikes me about Lee is that she, you know, is constantly striving to define herself and to carve out a space that's not contingent upon her being a woman, right? It's not, I think we see this over and over again. There's an expectation about how women are supposed to behave and then there's, how Lee behaves. And I think often she's talked about in reference to her relationship with men, uh, with very talented men. And I think what really strikes me about a lot of the pictures, both from her time in Paris, but, uh, but also from this sort of 1940s period is how she photographs women and how she seems so dedicated to uh, a portraiture that is so authentic that shows them as they might wish to be seen um, and and the sympathy with which she or at least it seems to me the sympathy with which she photographs these women who've been humiliated with their heads um, you know being shaved I think is you know she shows their humanity and I think that that's something that you know is really significant and, and she talks I think there's a quote from early on where she's one of the things that draws her to photography is that she's so struck by the way that different photographers can make her as a model look completely different. Um, and I think that, you know, there's something really fascinating in thinking through, you know, especially in the context of, of Lee's position in surrealism, right? You know, there are many, um, there are many surrealist women uh, artists and painters and who are often understood primarily in their role as, as muses or in their role as the wives or partners of, of more famous uh, husbands. I mean, I'm thinking of people like Jacqueline Lamba, but even, um, you know, people like Frida Kahlo with Salvador Dali kind of, uh, you know, the, the wives and the, the kind of messy network of artists, the, the women are often understood in, in relation to their relationship with men. And I think that's something that, that Lee is, is constantly striving to, you know, show women in their own right in these periods. So do you think in terms of the history of photography, is she breaking with a male gaze? Is that, that's a big question to ask. But it's... <laughs> <laughs> that's a big question to ask. And I'm also not a, uh, an expert in photography, but from an amateur's perspective, I think she's certainly offering uh, a unique perspective that is is not necessarily from a from a male gaze. Okay, thank you. Can I ask you, Amy, what what do, what do you want to say? I mean, these two kind of like pivotal moments in her her kind of like amazing kind of creative creative life. I suppose the question I would like to ask you is about the way in which other images of Lee Miller that have been that have been constructed. Um, what is the image that you, I mean, as a granddaughter, as somebody that's involved with the archive, I'm not saying it's the official line, but what is it that you in particular would want to foreground and recover from these, from these two moments do you think is crucial? As in a photographic image or as in a, a kind of theoretical image? Uh, well, both. I mean, it would be fascinating to hear your thoughts on both of those, but yeah. I suppose, first of all, in terms of her, her kind of like creative, um, uh, uh, her creative, uh, uh, her creative journey. I think, I think a, a lot of it's already been, been said by Hannah and, and Sarah. I would add that, we, you know, when, when I said earlier about how Paris initially gave her the, the space and the, live, the freedom to be able to reinvent herself. It also gave her the space to challenge the, the male view. And in, in her Paris early work, she, she does take um, images that, that challenge the way that men look at women. There's a um, picture, quite well-known pictures of her 
two pictures, which is of a severed breast from a radical mastectomy that she carried across Paris and um, set up on a plate in French Vogue studios and took fo two photographs of it before Hoenig and Hune found her and threw her out and the breast. And, it, and it's more in it, and, that, and in that period, she's taking self portraits of herself nude, of her close friends nude, but she's in those nudes, she's giving herself and her friends back their bodies. It's a very different, it's a, it's a very different to the sexualized pictures that Man Ray is taking of her and where he's chopping, a lot of the time he's chopping her up and she's got no head or, or it's her lips or it's her eye. She's giving them back their, their, their bodies and, and showing, but also at the same time showing how the beautiful forms of them. And, and I think that's quite an interesting way of looking at, at her too. She, she challenges as well as reinvents herself. Um, and she also challenges when she's in Paris, she challenges what's, what she sees with, the, with, with what's going on. She challenges the rules. As a war correspondent, you weren't allowed to cover combat, but she does, and she gets put under house arrest for it. She, um, in Rennes, she's tormented because she is disgusted by the collaborators but at the same time she writes that the two girls that are being spat on and then jeered at are you know they're they're really young they're in their teens if if that they're sisters and that they she thinks that they probably just just didn't have the education to have known better and she feels sorry for them at the same time so there's this it's an interesting way of, of her being able to challenge what's going on too. Right, that's really, really interesting. And particularly about what you were saying about the mastectomy, because in a way anticipating the much later work of say, somebody like a radical feminist photographer like Joe Spence, who was such a kind of pivotal kind of uh, uh, photographer in, in kind of bringing those images into the kind of public gaze in the 1970s and 1980s that's really really fascinating yeah and, and yet if you'd said to her are you a feminist she would have said no would she why why would she have said no because it's a label <laughs> it's a label she surrealists don't have labels and then, you know she challenged things but she and also don't forget that there's lots of different types of feminism and um, in her day, there it was um, it was a very different type of feminism that the the, the the multi kind of views of feminism that we have now. So yes, she would have definitely rejected it as a label, but she'd certainly challenged throughout her life, and didn't see why she should have why there should be different rules for for men and for women. Right. Okay. Right. That's fascinating. Can we go to you, Tony? Because we have got to now look at sort of wrapping up the event. But Tony, could you, in a way, if we could look to you for kind of like the final word in terms of, of what you want to say about this conversation, but particularly, I think, um, her relationship with Paris and her sense of, 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 of her personal journey of liberation. If you can just unmute yourself, please, Tony. It's also it's such a difficult and complex thing to respond to. I've greatly enjoyed listening to, to, to Hannah and to Sarah in, in all of this. Um, Paris meant so many things to Lee, but most of all, it meant liberation of her. And I think it was like her spiritual home. And for her, it was probably the place that she did best and felt freest in, in her life. When she was there, there were no constraints. When she was there with Man Ray, there was no constraints. There was no safety in it. There was nothing. She, she flew with, no, uh, with nothing except her own wit and her own talent to sustain her. And I think that is such a fantastic moment in anybody's life, is to be independent and succeed in such a way. And, and, and you know the the uh, the society, the French society, the French culture, and so on was just a perfect fit for her. Everything, 
in the food, the clothes, the wine, the language. And it just was like her, her soulmate, really. Okay, thank you. I mean, that's probably a wonderful way to, to finish this, this conversation. Um, before I thank everybody, uh, and it's been a wonderful conversation, I've learned such a lot just from asking the, the questions. Um, but could you say something, Tony and Amy, about the event? I mean, this is a Lee Miller Strand in the sort of Sussex Festival of Ideas. We've got an event tomorrow. Uh, at five o'clock, which I encourage all of you to, to, to attend, where you'll be talking about the origins of the, of the archive. So do you and Tony and Amy, do you want to just say something about the talk tomorrow, please? Thank you. Um, it's actually, a, it's a talk put together by Amy and it's called Attic to Archive. And I think I'd better let her just give you the outline of it. Uh, he's been modest because it's put together by both of us. And he's the one that discovered the archive. But it's a yeah, so it's a double hander. I sing, he dances. What more do you want to see? <laughs> <laughs> what we do is we, we take the process from the moment that we discovered the stash of Lee's material hidden in the attic, which was transformative because it changed my entire life. It changed the life of my late wife, Amy's mum. And it certainly changed the perception of Lee Miller because from that moment on, the genie was out of the bottle and it was only, you know, it's been a, been a difficult road. It's been a, but it's been a fascinating road to get from there in 1977 to where we are now, where Lee is sufficiently widely known that she has become a question in quiz games. You know, she's part of popular culture. At the same time, she's being discussed by people for whom I have the greatest respect, like Anna and Sarah and yourself. But we don't, we don't get who's he. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. I mean, this was how it was at the very beginning, because uh, you know, I, I would front up to uh, to a museum and uh, get to see the curator of photography, and they would say go away. Lee Miller is of no interest to us. She was simply a footnote to Man Ray's history. And, you know, that doesn't happen anymore. Not like that. Well, there's a link to Attic to Archives um, on the page for this event too. So it should be easy, easy to find if you do want to, to join us. Right. And I don't really sing, honestly. And it's the story of how we had to learn to become photo curators when there weren't many about, you know, it's not, not like it is now. And how we had to learn how to take care of this collection and to disseminate it. And, and, and what we discovered about Lee and about ourselves on the way. That is absolutely fascinating in terms of a sort of process of historical recovery. Um, and, and, and discovery that's fascinating so I'm certainly looking forward to that and I hope there is some singing and I hope <laughs> because that would be in the spirit of a surreal Lee Miller it seems to me absolutely um, yeah. I just want to kind of really uh, round uh, this conversation up um, it's been a really fascinating to have the insights of all four speakers I'd really like to thank uh, Tony and Amy from the Lee Miller Archive. That was wonderful in terms of sharing your kind of personal anecdotes, but also your kind of, I'd say, professional, curatorial kind of perspectives on the material. And thanks to, to Hannah and to, to Sarah. I think it was really wonderful, I think, having that wider historical <coughs> perspective, which allowed us to, to understand uh, Lee Miller's journey, really, as a journey that was right at the centre of the politics of the mid 20th century. So a kind of remarkable life of personal, political and artistic liberation and uh, somebody who found that liberation in, in Paris. Okay, thank you. I'm afraid we're gonna to have to end there very, very abruptly, uh, but thank you. And I'm gonna be there tomorrow at five o'clock for Attic to Archive like everybody else. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thank you, Mary.